have a presentation on this topic. It's very close uh, to what we are working on. So, you know, let's get started. Am I audible? Yeah, it's just going in my head. <laughs> so, uh, if you if you look at the traditional, uh, the manufacturing, uh, how it has been, the focus has always been to produce as much as possible, as accurately cost as possible, and as whatever productivity we can achieve, right? But now what we are seeing is because of the changing dynamics, because of the uh, the uh, social nature of our customers, uh, new demands are being placed on the manufacturing. And we have categorized these demands into two segments. One is for the, uh, the high volume production, where the demands are more in uh, to get more and more productivity while getting more and more uh, customized products out at the minimum possible, you know, uh, while maintaining the productivity and, and the cost structures. And also to uh, include as many different technologies as possible. On the other hand, we're also seeing the small batch productions, uh, the, where the demand is to get the lot size of one at a large scale condition. That means you need to have a lot size of one with the lowest possible investment and lowest possible setup times. And also getting into new technologies, for example, additive manufacturing, getting more and more robotics, getting more uh, flexible uh, cell structures. And what we see is that these demands are contradictory. In, in if, you, if you see it from a traditional uh, mindset of manufacturing, because how do you get a high variability, right? High uh, high changeover with a very less with a very low setup times, or how do you get a shorter product uh, life cycle with less uh, investment and less cost? Or how do you get uh, complete flexibility and complete automation at a very um, you know, uh, low cost? So what we're seeing is that uh, from a traditional point of view, these contradictions, these trade-offs have to be made, right? The answer to break these trade-offs is to change our mindset, change our paradigm, and change the way we are thinking and the way we look at the production. And that is what Factory of the Future is about. So I will talk about two mindset shift uh, with respect to factory of the future in this presentation. The first one is that we need to sh uh, start uh, thinking not from a linear, like uh, start, stop looking at the line from a linear perspective to a network perspective. That means we have to look at, from go from a linear topology to a network topology and go from a fixed uh, capacity and fixed throughput to a variable capacity and throughput and really go from a capacity driven uh, planning the process to a demand driven planning process and this is very important and what it means the implications are also huge because once you say uh, once we do not consider a line as fixed it changes everything we cannot use the fixed layout for the planning purposes like we used to right every time we have to uh, build a new product we have to reconfigure the line that means we need advanced systems that can take care of such changes and more importantly since you will be managing, uh, since you will be balancing the demand with your supply, so you have a demand, and if you pull off resources, you're already uberifying your business. You're already uberifying your manufacturing, right? So that's why it's a paradigm change. Uh, I would like to give an example of how we uh, from Bosch see uh, the factory of the future uh, happening in the future through an animation. So let's say there is a requirement for uh, manufacturing 500 pieces. Of a particular product, which has two components A and B. So you select the component, you select the line, uh, you provision the equipment, decide the material flow, and out you go. The material gets you know uh, produced. Now let's say the next week the demand is doubled. Let's say it's not going to 500. You have to produce 1,000 pieces, right? What do you do? You know that this system works, so you just replicate one more line, which is just get additional resources, right? Let's say week three, you know, you have a, a different set of requirement. Rather than making this particular component, you have to produce, let's say, a, a, a gripper. What you do is, okay, these are out. What you do is, you take out all the equipment that you do not need, you retain what you need, get the, uh, rearrange your shop floor, get the new machines, uh, the new equipment that is needed, and do the same provisioning of equipment, materials for production, and here you have a more customized product ready, right? So it's about how do you reuse your space, how do you uh, reuse the variable capacity of uh, uh, your machines to make different type of products every week, 
you know, that's, that's the vision. And you might say, you know, Swamil, that is great, you know, but how, where do I start? And this was the same question which we asked a few years ago. And from this point onwards, on the, uh, in this presentation, we'll talk about how do we make it happen? How do we start today and reach where our vision is? So we'll talk about four core competencies of Factory of the Future. And there are multiple other core competencies, but I think these are the super critical ones, because if you take any one of them out, the vision cannot be fulfilled, right? So what are these core competencies? The first one is connectivity at the machine level. It's super important to connect the machines. So you, have to, you, you take a machine, you put it to one of our gateways, hook it up to one of the clouds, right? And then you start seeing the data and the live status of the, of the machine uh, remotely. What it will allow you to do is number one, it will allow you to remotely monitor. That means you will see what is the capacity uh, utilization, what is the OEE, what is the parameters that the machine is running on, right? And that itself, as I'll show in the next slide, will give you a lot of boost in the productivity. The second step, when you start getting a more and more data, you can go for the break dimension. That means you know, now based on this pattern, this is how the machines work, and this is when they fail. So I'll be able to uh, keep the uptime by predicting uh, the failures. And the third and more, most important is remote configuration, that is ability to download the work instruction, uh, work instruction and parameters to your machine remotely. And we'll see why this is so important. Uh, as an example, so this is one of our uh, Chazy plants where we make this ABS uh, ECUs. We have connected, this is uh, data from 2015, we have connected around 11 plants with more than, more than, more than 5,000 machines which are connected, producing uh, more than 26 million units per year, and we have seen a productivity increase of up to 25%, you know, and this productivity has come by using the machines, uh, using the spare capacity of the machines which we did not know existed, right? And now, in the first part we discussed that now the, in the factory of the future the layout will not be constant the machine will keep changing right that means you cannot plan your production on the layout then what do you plan it on how do you plan your production the answer to this question is the next generation uh, demand planning and production planning has to be done either on the product or on a proxy of the product right you really have to bring the product to the center of manufacturing right and the way you do that is you connect it to either RFID or some technology so that you can trace and visualize the product as it moves in the line remotely. And when that happens, you will be able to plan the entire cycle of your production around the product. The way it will happen, you know, is that if you have to, let's say, produce the same 500 pieces, you start with looking at your demand, looking at your availability of the resources, and you start with scheduling. So now we are going in, in the reverse way, right? So first we are scheduling, then the part will uh, communicate with the machine and tell what parameter, what, what programs have to be uh, run on the machine to accomplish uh, or to uh, you know uh, product, produce those specific parts. The third step would be to design the right layout. That means once you have done the scheduling, you know which machines are going to be used and how, and then you design the perfect layout, and then you configure the timely transport. While working in this particular way where you uh, put all your resources behind the product, you have three uh, advantages. Number one, the operation that you're doing today will not just be time-based, they will also become event-based. That means your machines will not be lying idle waiting for the material. The material will be uh, guiding and material will be leading the production. The second is, you will have complete traceability. That means you know which part has been manufactured in which machine and under what parameters. So tomorrow if you have a defect anywhere, you can trace it back and say where it was actually injected. And the third, part is that this is a bit of a cliche but it really puts the demand and the customer in the center that means the entire process of manufacturing is concentrated to fulfill this demand and this order right and this is very important and we have to take this concept a little a, a little bit more further and what we're calling it as develop a digital twin of the parts and what we mean by digital twin is that all the information that you need to manufacture this part whether it's a bill of process bill of material uh, whether it's uh, the resources, so the manpower, the skill requirement, the machine hour requirement, uh, the demand patterns, uh, the work instructions, quality processes, and even the inventory status. Everything has to be available in an executable format on a single platform. And this uh, information has to be available to each and every system. It has to be available to the robots, 
It has to be available uh, to the people working on the shop floor, and it should also be available to other systems, for example, the ERP systems and uh, uh, your AI systems. What we take from there is that we take the machine and the part into what you call it as an industry 4.0 platform, right? So everybody is talking about industry 4.0, but here we see how do we really take it forward. So you have we have connected the machine and uh, the part together. What we get? Is a matrix like this. Now this is interesting because it, as you can see, here you can see which machines are available, slightly at risk, not available, and which parts are available at risk and, and you know available. And based on this, you can actually see in the real time which of my operations can happen without a problem, which of them would be at risk, and which of them are not possible. And this is where uh, the productivity comes from. When you have this information ready at your uh, you know, in front of you, you can take decisions in the real time. What next to be done, right? So we can visualize the operations. We can manage the data and the model. That means um, all the data that we are getting from uh, installed and on the cloud, run it, uh, analyze them, and develop the applications. Uh, uh, the, the, the applications to boost the transparency, to boost uh, the warranty, to boost quality, so all those applications that you want to develop for industry 4.0, which will give you instant efficiency, instant productivity, can be made possible just by connecting the machines and the parts together. And I would like to uh, take it one step further that the same platform that we are building for industry 4.0 can also be used to configure the machines and configure the, part, uh, configure the processes when we go in the factory of the future. So this platform is actually the most critical element because this will hold all your data and all your processes in a way where it can they can be manipulated to create new strategies. An example uh, that we have, uh, you know, what we have implemented is on in is a uh, in our Hamburg plant in Germany, where by connecting the lines and the parts, so we have connected all our machines and we have implemented what is called as a RFID based e-kanban, and we have seen uh, the savings up to 0.5 million euros per line. 30% reduction uh, in the stock because now that we know the inventory, uh, there is no there is no information lag between the actual inventory and the posting. We can really we don't have to put the extra safety stocks anymore. That has caused give us a, given us a lot of uh, reduction in the stock and also given us a 10% output increase, which is just by we are now able to utilize the the, uh, the machines much better. The third component of the third core competence, you know. Uh, after the machine and uh, part is what you're working on right now is what you call as supervised intelligence. So this is the AI bit which allows you to configure and control your machines remotely. So your robots and your, uh, your customer machines. The AI which will allow you to model and simulate different layout patterns. So that means uh, for what we've seen in the animation, when as you go from the demand number one to demand number three, when you have to change the complete layout, how will this actually work? Is it optimized? Is, is our line balanced? So all the balancing is what we believe the AI will be doing it. Uh, smart automation, that means managing the day-to-day -day, uh, activities of the plant, delegation, automating some of these activities, uh, optimizing the material flow, and also uh, we feel AI could be very, very important in terms of the quality processes. We have we've already seen that using, uh, combining AI with the machine vision and, uh, and augmented reality, we have been able to see how can we automate some of the uh, test procedures and also how can we make so a lot of there are a lot of sample based testing how can we make convert the sample based testing to 100% online testing using uh, high speed image processing and the uh, example or the use cases that we see uh, for this ai is modeling and analytics so how do we model different parameters or different configurations and how do we analyze them how do we automate decisions because if we are able to uh, automate some of the decisions and delegate it to the machines, it will free up human productivity to try out different things, to try out uh, new and new configurations, which we believe will be very important uh, from a factory of the future perspective. Evaluate different strategies and finally make recommendations. So when the AI has learned enough and when, the, when, we, when, it, when we feed them enough data and enough uh, information about how the plant has been run, both right and wrong, AI will be able to give us the recommendation on what it thinks. For example, in uh, from the uh, earlier animation now we have we know how the line works for 500 pieces versus 1000 pieces what if the order is for 700 pieces that is a, uh, a bit of information that we expect the ai to kind of give us what could be the probable configuration 
for uh, making, making 700 pieces. And lastly, the most, uh, the, the last and the most important core components in, in my uh, you know, opinion, and this is what I've also learned from experience, is the empowering people. Uh, and this is where we have discussed with, us, with so many customers and we realized that no matter how many machines you connect, no matter how many parts you connect, no matter how uh, you know, complex AI systems you deploy, unless people are empowered to really make decisions and make a difference, right? It doesn't work. And what we need to, what, what we are, what we are promoting is, number one, we have to build the risk confidence because people understand data, but they don't relate to data in the same way as we expect them to be. There's a, there's a very uh, simple, now if you go to a traffic light, the red, green, and yellow is a universal standard. Everybody understands, right? So, but that's, the same cannot be done for a pie chart, or for a graph chart, uh, or for a bar chart. So we need to develop this competence where people can understand data and act on it. Second is, people need to really start experimenting and organizations need to, need to encourage them to experiment. So if you have a line and uh, if somebody has an idea, they should be encouraged to see if something more can be done. Third is uh, simulating scenarios. So what happens, answering questions like what happens if the demand increases by 20% or what happens if uh, a, a supplier is not able to supply or what happens if a particular machine breaks down, right? And simulating these scenarios and the creating response protocol is what I think people have a very important role to play. Because to, if you take an analogy, when there's an emergency, the fire department does not discuss, sit and discuss and what has to be done. They already, they work on the uh, standard protocols. And that is what needs to be done for manufacturing. Because if we have to, if we want to uh, manage the disruptions without impacting the cost, schedule and productivity, the scenarios have people really need to know what needs to be done when such a situation arises. And that is why simulating the scenarios and creating response protocol is you know, one of the very, very important things from a factory of the future perspective. So, so, so we, have, we have discussed uh, you know, the four competencies. I just want to uh, sum it up together, put it up together. Uh, when you look at core competence model uh, for a factory, we discussed four things. Uh, first is that we need more flexible and connected machines. Uh, we need connected parts and their twins, digital twins on uh, the digital platform. We need digital workforce that understands and can work on uh, the uh, data. And we need the supervisory intelligence. Now, this is easier said than done. And I know this is very, very difficult for anybody who is starting afresh. So what we have done from Bosch is that we have created tools and systems that will help you build these competencies. To give you an example, if you look at the Bosch Active Cockpit solution, it is a very interactive solution that allows you to visualize the data in a way where you can actually hold meetings and you can actually you know, have a very engaging discussion without worrying about the documentation. So you can really experience it and see how, 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 how it really changes the, the conversation, not focusing on uh, the discussion, but really focusing on the action. Similarly, uh, APAS, the collaborative robot, has, been, has helped us automate the pick and place process so that it can collaborate very well uh, with humans. You know, in, in, in a very safe and secure way. Uh, the Bosch Active Shuttle can be configured to transport material between the lines and outside the lines in a very, very modular and efficient way. And finally, the Nexeed platform that uh, we have developed allows you to not only create digital twins, but also uh, put host your analytics platform, um, you know, execute your manufacturing strategies. So this is something which if you can use it, it will help you manage your connectivity and manage your parts in a very, very elegant way, right? So this is what I uh, would like to, you know, wanted to present and uh, want to end with that from Bosch, we really believe in the factory of the future and its potential to transform the manufacturing and we invite you to believe with us. Uh, we, have, we have got a few demonstrations in our booth. I would like to invite you all to, you know, kindly come over and have, you know, experience it and please feel free to write to me uh, if you have any questions. Thank you.